Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to look at Baroness Barker's contribution in the House of Lords when Lord Blencathren moved Amendment 97ZA. Um, this was an amendment that sought to ensure that women were incarcerated in single-sex spaces and that there was provision provided for men with a transgender identity either in with the other men or in a specialist unit where they could be kept in a safe manner. Um, the amendment was ultimately withdrawn, but it's still important for us to see who said what in this debate, because it leads us to a greater understanding of who it is that we have to convince, who we are wasting our time trying to convince, and who it is that is a, an ally in, in our fight. Let's listen to what Baroness Barker has to say. My, my, lords, uh, my lords, it won't be, uh, because this woman disagrees with this amendment. And I speak, as, I speak as a woman who cares very deeply about the safety and the physical safety of women. And one of the things that I find most objectionable about the campaign which is being run in the media, uh, and has been run for the last couple of years, is the assumption that those of us who are women who stand as allies with trans people don't, because I just don't believe that that is uh, the case at all. Um, it would be very tempting at this stage to answer some of the very wide-ranging points which have been made, polls with leading questions, misinterpretations, misstatements of the law, but I won't do that. I will simply stick to the facts that I think that this, this House should, should look at when, uh, when it is make, coming to a decision on this matter. The noble Lord Ben Cathra spoke about an entitlement of prisoners to go to an estate. There is no such entitlement. The noble Baroness Baroness Jones talked about instances when male prisoner, when so identifying male prisoners had predated upon women. That has happened. But it has not happened, my understanding is that it has not happened, since the implementation of the policy which is now operational and has been operational I think since 2016, updated in 2019, in the, in the prison service. There are historic cases and they are trotted out all the time by people who, are, who wish to disparage uh, trans people. Let's say it's absolutely clear what the current policy that is operated in our prisons is. A proper assessment of risk is paramount in the management of all individuals subject to custodial and community sentences. The management of individuals who are transgender, particularly in custodial and AP settings, must seek to protect both the welfare and rights of the individual and the welfare and the rights of, custody, of other people in custody around them. These two risks must be carefully considered and fully and balanced against each other. Decisions must be formed by all available evidence and intelligence in order to achieve an outcome that balances risks and promotes the safety of all individuals in custody. My understanding from talking to, uh, from talking to prison officials is that not only is there no entitlement for a, for a prisoner to be held in an estate, that risk assessment includes a uh, an assessment of whether somebody is attempting to be transferred into an estate in order to perpetrate further crimes. And if they are, that is held as a contraindication. I agree absolutely with the noble Lord Lord Hope and the noble Lord Lord Panic. What we have now is a policy which uh, does, as the noble Baroness, uh, Baroness uh, uh, Kishwa Faulkner said to us, does, does put to the fore the human rights of individuals, but it balances them with the safety of everybody, and that includes the staff as well in prisons. Let's not forget, let's not forget them. And this, therefore, that Lord, Lord, Lord Mancathra is putting to us was is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an amendment which is neither based on evidence and it's a retrograde step. So I would urge noble lords to reject it. So we just listened to Baroness Barker's speech and the thing that comes through very clearly for me, first of all, is that she is adamant that there have been no sex attacks by trans identified men in women's prisons since the guidance was changed. Now the guidance was changed because of the famous case of Karen White, 
who was a bloke with multiple new identities every few years, who was convicted of all sorts, a whole string of, of things in his criminal history, um, dishonesty as well as violence and sexual violence. And um, he, he went on to um, perpetrate further violence while inside, while on remand, uh, which he then later was convicted of, of, of multiple uh, assaults along with the original uh, conviction that he was um, on trial for. So um, much was made of this case by both sides. My side of the debate obviously said, look at this example. This is the most egregious example of somebody abusing um, this uh, gender self-identification which has crept into the prison service. The other side said, OK, well, we, we don't want to repeat of that. That's not good for optics. So we're going to create some guidance, which means that we're going to be able to weed out any of the people likely to perpetrate these abuses. The problem with this is that if women were able to identify abusive men, we wouldn't be constantly murdered by men at a rate of two or three a week. If we were able to identify abusive men, we wouldn't be raped particularly by husbands, partners, boyfriends, people that we're on a date with, friends that think that somehow they're entitled to our bodies, people that rape us when we're drunk, people that rape us when we're children, people that rape us when we're old. They're men. They're men that do this. And whether or not they have a transgender identity, they are a risk to women. We are at risk when we are um, in a in a place with 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 a man and um, <sighs> the idea of being locked up with somebody that could put you at risk of that is too much to bear sometimes. So the other side have great faith in the idea that there are various magical words that you can say that mean that you can identify which men are a threat and which men are not a threat. There are no magic words that identify which men are a threat. It's true that the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour and so we can already know that we need to exclude any men with a history of sexual violence, any men with a history of violence against women and children from women's spaces. But it's so much easier and so much better safeguarding to just say we're going to exclude all men from women's spaces because women are allowed the safety, privacy and dignity that they are entitled to in law by being incarcerated in a single sex space. It, it really isn't rocket science. I've looked into some of her history. She's a fairly prominent person in the House of Lords. She's the Deputy Speaker of the House of Lords, so she she has quite some authority. She's very, very active. Um, obviously, as Deputy Speaker, she's, she's often involved in debates. It is interesting to pull out from her history the debates that are relevant to women's rights because there are many instances of Baroness Barker knowing exactly who are the group of people at risk of on a base violence, hymenoplasty, which is a surgical recreation of a flap of skin that's sometimes found in women before sexual intercourse, which is often uh, a family or a culture will provide pressure on a young girl who may have been raped or may have had a sexual experience because there is a purity test at the point of marriage, which is incredibly sexually abusive. So the solution is for, for some cultures and for some families to put pressure on a girl to undergo a procedure where they recreate this 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 flap of skin in the vagina. Um, so she recognises that it is women that are at risk of that. Women and girls are at risk of that. And she's very clear in her language, because if you were to come into the House of Lords and start talking about birthing persons, uh, receptive partners, passive partners or whatever the, the latest gibberish is, you would be laughed at. Because these are people who are who are elders and very experienced in the ways of the world and they know exactly which sex it is that, that has a, a risk of honour-based violence. And more, Baroness Barker will say, I recognise that some things are more common, like honour-based violence is, is associated with certain ethnic or cultural groups. Or religious groups. 
so she's recognizing one or two of the protected characteristics there, but she's not recognizing by stating clearly and the sex that are at risk of this violence is females and they're at risk of violence from males which is the which is the kind of the, the the crowning solution to the whole thing anyway in addition to that there are other things that we can learn from her history of spoken contributions so even if she's not using the words in the way that i would use them I can support her advocacy of the rights of the class of people who are subjected to sex-based oppressions <laughs> around the world. We share membership of that group and I am grateful for her advocacy for us as a sex class. Where she loses me is where her allegiance to the LGBTQRSVP lobby overrides her fealty to her sisters. And the first indication I came across of this in her history was a, a reference to um, wanting to support the rights of LGBT couples to access fertility services. Now there are two there are two ways that this that this works. Okay, so lesbians are discriminated against when uh, lesbians come into contact with the health service, particularly when they are seeking fertility treatment. And she has highlighted um, specific instances where lesbian women are discriminated against when they seek fertility care. And um, whereas I personally don't, you see, I personally don't think anybody has a right to a baby, but I recognise that for lesbians, this may be the only way they can have a baby. So, um, yeah, I'm in two minds about it. I mean, for straight couples as well, there's, there's no right to have a baby. At the same time, it's easy for me to say that I didn't require fertility care. So, you know, it's easy. It's easy to make pronouncements when you aren't personally affected, isn't it? I can't judge a woman. Understanding what that drive is like to have a child, I cannot judge a woman for having that drive and wanting to advocate for any kind of medical intervention that will help her have a baby of her own. I understand that drive. But where we come into trouble is that there is a drive to include gay men in this, in this overall umbrella of LGBTQ access to fertility services. And one of the things you'll notice about gay men is that neither of them have a womb. And because of that, they seek to purchase or rent a womb, which comes with a woman attached, obviously. And therefore, um, we see support for surrogacy arrangements. Now, this I am not on the fence on. This is human trafficking. This is child trafficking. And I do not support it under any circumstances. So anytime anybody says that they support the rights of LGBTQ people to fertility treatment, I'm always very interested to learn which LGBT people are you talking about and which fertility services are you talking about? And ultimately, this is where those questions lead. When you look at Baroness Barker's Register of Interests, you'll see that there are several things listed there which confirm her membership of the LGBT lobby. The first one is um, Give Out. Now, this is a charity which aims to funnel donations to various groups of um, charity charitable organisations working for specific aims to progress the rights of LGBTQ, WTF people throughout Europe and the world. Some of these aims are laudable. Uh, there should be no uh, death penalty for loving somebody. That's just crazy. And so obviously I support that. Um, however, I cannot support this charity. Uh, made me pretty angry actually to go and really look into uh, what it is that they support and who it is that they call women, for instance. 
Um, the second charity is called the Alfred Kennedy Trust. Again, this is another charity which aims to serve the needs of LGBTQ, WRSVTUV, WXYZ, or whatever. Um, this is a charity which aims to help youth at risk of homelessness. I need not tell you what my what my concerns are about this because this is a vulnerable group of young people who have clearly suffered already a fracturing from their family group and they deserve to be safeguarded very very well and I am I am concerned that there aren't always those safeguards in place however I haven't gone into their safeguarding policy in detail so I'm not going to um, rip them apart the aim is laudable let's just draw a line and leave it at that the third one is the Peter Tatchell Foundation Uncle Peter we all know about Uncle Peter don't we uh, yeah so these are the three directorships which are in the Register of Interests for Liz Barker, Baroness Barker. So there we have it. So should you write to Baroness Barker? I don't. I don't think it's going to work. Again, this is somebody that we share many aims in common. When she is speaking about the rights of women to access um, medical abortion tablets, uh, you know, she is advocating for the rights of women. It would be so much better to advocate for the rights of women and define women as a group in a way that is consistent across all of her advocacy. But she cannot do that without coming into conflict with the LGBTQ lobby, which she is a paid up member of. And they are not going to take their hooks out of somebody who's the Deputy Speaker of the House of Lords. This is what we mean when we say that this group of people have huge institutional and establishment power. Hard power and soft power. When you look at the charity uh, give out and you look at the number of people who are donating regularly to all of these different charities, all pushing the same ideology from different directions, and you think about what that actually means, um, compare that with the women in Turf Island who are pushing against this ideology, who are, you know, our crowd funders have raised, I believe, a total of about two million pounds, which is incredible over a period of years. But this is a drop in the ocean compared to the funding that is provided for all these different LGBT charities. Um, who are also provided by grants um, from the government, particularly the Scottish and Welsh devolved administrations. We are really up against it. And so um, although it is a real burden for women to bear, we already have to suffer a pay gap. We already aren't paid as much. We are put on the mummy track at work. And then out of the pay that we do get, we're expected to subsidise a bunch of bloody crowdfunders because the organisations that we've donated to all our lives don't actually support women's rights. We're living in clown world. So thanks for joining me for the video today. It would be great if you could leave me a like, if you could subscribe to the channel, and if you could share this video with somebody that you think might be interested in it politics is really dry and the, and the workings of the House of Lords is very dry. I understand that, but I do think it's important that we document what is going on here because there will be an awful lot of reverse ferreting going on very shortly. So thank you for joining me as we discuss Liz Barker. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again very soon.